Good morning, everybody, and welcome to Wake Up Missoula. I'm your host, Scott Ramp, ushering you to the end of 2019. I will not be in next Friday, the 27th. It is currently December 20th right now, and I have a lot to show, and I have a lot to tell. I even got Susan Campbell Renault here talking about Santa socks, where she's going around town and delivering Santa socks and other trinkets this uh, holiday season for veterans. All right, so let's talk a little bit about weather before we dive right into all the other stuff. So it is currently 43 degrees outside. Your high is going to be 46. It, it was a pretty, uh, it's not so bad outside, but a lot of the snow that kind of stuck around has kind of frozen. And so, so there's some of that kind of like weird kind of perma snow that they have on the ground. So you want to be, want to, might want to try to avoid some of that stuff as well. Um, some of the wet areas are wet and some of the areas that haven't been shoveled or anything like that are slippery. So, uh, like I said, watch out for that. Uh, high is going to be into the 40 degrees temperatures this weekend. And then we're going to dip a little bit more as we leave this weekend with, uh, 20% chances of snow with rain mixtures happening for the next week. Uh, hopefully we might get a white Christmas, but uh, from these uh, from this weather, we, we don't know. We can only hope. All right, so local news, uh, city of Missoula, um, and so did many other cities around the state, uh, did some anti-Trump uh, protesters uh, w went out in front of Steve Senator Steve Dane's offices in Missoula. Um, many locals are trying to get GOP Senator Steve Dane's to vote to impeach Trump uh, for obstruction of justice, while many, not all, uh, Republicans have shown no wavering support for and against impeachment. Uh, 500 folks gathered in the Impeach and Remove in Hamilton, Kalispell, and Whitefish. MoveOn.org sponsored these protests to stand up to Trump. Missoula County uh, Republican Party committee leaders organized a counter rally with at least a third of the crowd waving flags, standing and chanting in support of Trump. Of course, I'm not going to... Uh, I'm going to count this as some of the national news as well because I'm going to dive into what's going on so far because one of the biggest things that are happening within the uh, House of uh, Representatives in the U.S. level is that uh, they voted to uh, impeach with two articles. One is obstruction of justice, which was uh, 229 to 198 votes, and then the... Uh, abuse of power, which was 230 votes to 197 votes, with most votes being along party lines. Of course, um, with the obstruction of justice, two Democrat, uh, a Democrat and an independent voted against uh, articles of impeachment for that one. Uh, the Senate will decide whether or not to follow through. Uh, since they have the right to remove Trump, um, they'll have the final say in a trial by um, this. But um, in most um, cases, since there is no uh, majority who is going to uh, vote for it. It seems like uh, Trump will be acquitted in the Senate. Uh, so, but so far, Majority Speaker uh, of the House Nancy P Pelosi is withholding articles from the Senate to gain leverage for a fair trial. These articles may not be, do anything, but Dems believe that this will be effective voting outcome in the 2020 election. Besides Trump uh, re-elections, the House has elections every two years, so this could be a major change for the House election coming up 2020. But so far, there's 35 Senate seats that are up for election. Uh, there's 23 uh, Republican seats and 12 uh, Democratic incumbents looking to hold on to their seats this next coming election. Um, so I'm just going to give you a couple numbers. This is according to uh, 272win.com. Uh, so in the GOP, uh, there's 11 for sure, uh, and there's seven likely. Uh, for Democrats, there's six for sure with four likely. Um, and there's about a toss-up. There's about four to six uh, Senate seats that might be a toss-up between uh, Republicans and Democrats. But uh, 33 Dems... 30 uh, Republicans and two independent party seats are not bound to change this year. In state news, the flavor ban on e-cigarettes have fully went into effect as of Wednesday. So if you know of any vapor or juice shop that is selling juice or uh, flavored uh, nicotine, flavored uh, blueberry, whatever, bubble gum, that is uh, now being enforced by the Department of Health and Human Services, which is out of Hamilton, Montana. Vape shop owners sued the state in October, challenging the ban as arbitrary and capricious, and asked District Judge Jennifer Lint of Hamilton to block its enforcement while she decided to over, to decided the overall lawsuit. Of course, late Tuesday, uh, Lint rejected the request and strongly indicated that she believes that the rule can withstand legal scrutiny. Lint said that the state had presented a strong case that flavored vaping products had led to an explosion in use by teenagers. So if you wish to tattle on anyone in the Missoula uh, local establishment, you can contact your local city county health department that uh, 
the prevention of tobacco. Otherwise, Hamilton is the home office of the Department of Health and Human Services. For any questions, you can log on to DPHH s.mt.gov uh, for more information. Uh, of course, it is basically right on their page if you wanted to write anybody out. But that's your choice. Um, and then most of this stuff, like I said, is complaint driven. And, and this is uh, part of a 120 day ban as the Montana state legislature looks to uh, more solidify this ban moving forward. All right. So anyways, um, I have a guest, and before I, I bring her out, I have an art clip for you guys. And this is an art clip that will be showing um, until the end of this year. And I believe it's the, let's just double check to make sure I'm on the right. Hold on one second. Okay, this is the new art clip, and this is from the Zootown Arts Community Center. And this will end as soon as the new year begins. So without further ado, here is the Zach. And when I come back, I'll have Susan Campbell Renault on. <laughs> That's good to know. <laughs> no pressure. No pressure. Uh, but this season, uh, you can feel the love in terms of love pressure with the Santa socks um, <laughs> as we uh, dive into Santa socks. And here is Santa Baby. I'm Santa Baby from the North Pole. And um, your listeners, actually, your viewers came through. You did a wonderful public service yeah. announcement. And uh, we got some wonderful volunteers. We ended up with about 40 magical elves from the North Pole. Great. And uh, this is a famous Santa sock. Mm -hmm. And a, fa a Santa sock contains all kinds of little treats, not, not expensive, just little things. And the all-important kid card. Yep. And um, this year, thanks to 2,000 kid cards, we have uh, from uh, Russell Elementary and from Washington Middle School. Nice. So these are absolutely adorable. I don't know if anyone can see these, but they're really, really cute. This one is, I think... I think it's from a kindergartner. Oh, very cute. And most of this is to uh, just uh, for the holiday season, you know, to help uh, veterans. And a holiday season to is a cope. very to yeah. cope. It's a very trying time in the holidays. And you know, there's just a lot of pressure. You know, like Merry Christmas, Happy Holidays, and stuff like that. With yeah. those kind of things, it's a lot of pressure for people to just be cheery for the holidays. Well, and Santa Socks actually was a program begun 12 years ago by veterans. And they needed someone that had a little bit of spunk that could get it organized. So they asked me to help. And of course, I said yes. And um, this year, we have, for the first time, Cabela's as one of our sponsors. And Cabela's donated eight Hundred socks. Oof. So that's a lot of socks, and these are really good socks. These are really good socks. Yeah, they're really good socks. <laughs> so everybody is going, whoa, these are really good socks. Um, but last weekend, we went to a lot of nursing homes, and we went to the Paparello Center, and we've been going to private homes this year, or this weekend, we're starting today. We're going to a veterans group 
and then we're going down the Bitterroot, and we have a Santa Claus that went out to Sanders County. We have another uh, magical elf from the VFW Post 209 Honor Guard that has been hitting Alberton and Houston and Frenchtown. So we actually have um, magical elves all over the place. And um, in addition, some of the some of our veterans also get hand knitted hats. Wow. That are from um, Martha's Ministries and Raps for um, Raps for Vets and um, one lady, Joan Dodge, who is Grandma Elf, has coordinated 517 hats. Wow. That's a lot of knitting. That's a lot of knitting. Uh, not me. I don't do right? that. Oh, right. But um, in addition, we, we put a love note. This is the love note. <laughs> and the love note lists all the sponsors. And the sponsors include Walmart and Target and Costco, all the ones you would suspect. But they also are Brett's RV and Marine and um, Culver's foreign car repair shop and the individuals and uh, majestic madness beauty shop wow. and um, m many many hotels because we put down in here lotions and um, we have had so much fun with this and um, Santa socks is something people can contribute to through the United States of Hope. And the United States of Hope also works with suicide and with veteran support on many levels. They take people out hunting, they um, do special programs and so on. And um, if people want to help, they can email me. And it's Blue Mountain, all one word. Yep. Lowercase spelled out. Yep. Blue Mountain at Montana.com. Blue Mountain at Montana.com. Yes. If you know a veteran or you're a veteran, yes. looking. And we will deliver. In fact, we are delivering to a World War II female veteran Whoa. in Bonner in the next few days. And Julie, you're out there. We're going to go get a Santa. <laughs> this is your Santa sock. Well, they're coming. They're coming, baby. <laughs> and uh, we are going to be delivering past Christmas because we have already delivered. This is kind of cool. Yep. Over a thousand Santa socks. Wow. And just because Christmas is over doesn't mean Santa socks is. We are, no. And it says, the, the message actually says, Happy New Year. Yep. So um, we will deliver until we're finished. We have about 200 more Santa socks to deliver. And you are really uh, amazed just how many socks have already been given uh, out. They have been given out. In fact, last night I went to an American Legion dinner, and there was one of my magical elves, and he said, I need more Santa socks. And um, everyone is surprised at how much people really appreciate something as little as this. I presented a Santa sock to a gentleman that had been in Vietnam, and he said, do you know that I, I served in the Army and I served in the Navy, and I was a career person, and I've never been thanked. And this is the first time I ever had been thanked. And he was actually in tears. And... Many of us who are our magical elves have had that experience. So yeah. it is very special. And you were asking me off camera, right? How many yes. people are veterans? We have thousands of veterans in Montana. Yeah. We have about a million people, and ten percent or more, possibly eleven percent of our adult population are veterans, and that includes young people like you. So it's a huge percentage yeah. because overall... And it's less, 10 times more than most other states per capita. Correct. We are the highest per capita of veterans, and so every single person out there probably has at least one person in their family that is either active duty or a veteran. Yep. And I mean, like if you go out the grocery store, um, one in 10 people... Uh, absolutely. I mean, every every tenth person or more yeah. is a veteran, and they're very quiet. You never know. In fact, finding veterans is kind of almost like a detective, you know, like, but if they're wearing a hat, and sometimes you can tell by the way they walk, they're very, you know, 
yep. resolute. And um, but anyway, it's it's uh, Santa socks is something that many of us who did it like we had to make up more Santa socks at the North Pole the other day because we had given out so many. We have one female Army veteran that is also with the VFW Honor Guard that has given out so many Santa socks that we literally had to make up more Santa socks just for Renata. <laughs> she is really good. I don't know where she's finding her veterans, but she's doing a great job. Nice. So just thanks to all the people who are working, the veterans who serve, the veterans who will serve in the future as well. Yep. You never know. Anybody can be a future veteran. And they can, can, and they can be your age. We can recruit you. No! <gasps> <gasps> <laughs> right. But there, it's fun, and if people have a veteran of any age or active duty that, that would like to receive, would like them to receive a little bit of a lift, and it's a, it's a real pair of socks. See, this is a real pair. A real pair of socks with little treats in it. Please email me, and we will we will get that Santa sock to your veteran. And again, that email is Blue Mountain at Montana dot org. Yes. Oh no. Dot com. Dot com. My not bad. org. It's dot com. Sorry about that. <laughs> all right. So thanks, Susan. I appreciate you coming down here, and I hope you have a very happy holidays, and New Year's, all that stuff that's happening as well. And merry merry Christmas. All right. We'll be right back right after this. With respect to, to how we're financing these things, it's been pretty interesting to me. The, the first project that was done in this series of three was obviously the first interstate in Park Place. And that was a public sale of bonds. Um, that's the last public sale we've done in, in Missoula as a redevelopment agency. Every other bond issue, and there have been, gosh, there have probably been six or better that have been done since that one. Um, have all been private placements with local banks. It's, it's quicker, it's easier, uh, as long as you make sure you're getting as good a deal as you would get on the public sale. You, you don't have the underwriting costs that you have with the public sale of bonds. The money stays local um, and you can do it in a fraction of the time that it takes to, and a fraction of the upfront costs. If you do a public offering, you've got all kinds of legal and financial paperwork that has to be done that um, hits six figures pretty quickly in terms of, of professional fees and, and uh, closing costs. So, Tsunami was in December 2004, 9.2 on the Richter scale, massive. It was right off the coast of Sumatra, so this is very, very close to the epicenter, Banda Aceh. And across 14 countries, there were 230,000 people that died. So huge event. And James, right after this happened, knew he wanted to fly immediately to Sumatra and he decided to just photograph whatever he saw for two days. And when I met him, he was asking me what I was doing with my career and with my work and I told him about Hurricane Katrina and he said, crazy, I wonder what Sumatra looks like. And so we kind of co-came up with this idea that I would travel with his images. Hey guys, welcome back. And now it's time for a little bit of uh, movie time. It's time for some pre-critic. Ah, like the... Fast and the Furious franchise, we have yet another Star Wars film where the uh, critics are just like, eh, well, the audience is like, yeah, but a little more uh, less dis uh, divisive um, in terms of this because they played it safe. And you can expect this movie to play it safe as this movie dives into... The Rise of the Skywalker. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Blah, blah, blah. J.B. Abrams picks up where Ryan Le uh, Johnson left off. Basically, Ryan Johnson was just like, you know what? I'm going to do my movie, 
And if the fans don't like it, that's their problem. And then J.J. Abrams is like, well, I'm a fan of the Star Wars films, and I'm going to make this movie for the fans because I'm a fan. And there you go. That's basically what you can expect from this movie. There's nothing you're going to I guess you're going to get what you you're going to get what you see. You know, you see what you get and it's going to be like it's like I want this to happen. Well, it's probably going to happen. So there you go. You got fan service. All right, moving on. You got uh, the uh, hellscape that is um, very trippy and very weird kind of movie. And, you know, everybody has theater friends and everybody uh, has that kind of obsession with some of these shows and some of these Broadway musicals. And this one ran for a long time on Broadway, London, and it was in that adaptation. It's called Cats. Hey, if, you know, who has a thing against cats? There's always cat people. People like cats. And so you get to see an anamorphic cat people as they navigate their uh, lives through the world of late night streets of London. And they have cat lives and um, they're just kind of hanging out. And they're CGI, cat people, dancing, singing. It's a musical. And, you know, depending upon if this is good or not, it doesn't really matter. It's going to be really weird and really trippy. And you might enjoy it for, for that reason alone. So, who knows? It in the world of cats. Up next, we got a movie that is quite the bombshell. And in the vein of the hashtag MeToo comes the biggest shakeup in a television history. Fox News will be the focus of this film about blonde women who called out their bosses for sexual favors for career boosts. This movie will probably have a kind of young shell inherit the world, but the first, the old must burn it down for the forest to grow once again. Uh, there was a lot of, I'm going down, you're coming down with me in this movie. What happens to the TV news network who control information handle this. So this movie is basically about um, public image and all that kind of stuff. But you can expect one of those movies where it's just kind of like where it becomes kind of preachy and things happen and things don't happen the way you want it to happen and maybe they fire the guy, but it still doesn't improve the the overall culture that has been created from it. All right, so, or actually it hasn't been created. It's always been there. Moving on, those are some of the movies that are coming out this weekend that you can probably skip. Honestly, what you see is what you get from a lot of these movies. There's not anything you're going to be like blindsided from in terms of movie magic and stuff like that. All right, so I have a movie that I guys uh, that I want to show you guys as well. It is a holiday fun cheer from the uh, Jack Benny program. And without further ado, here is Dub and Stuff. And then when I return, I got some city council for you guys. <laughs> No one's going to suspect me, an adult man dressed up as a little boy. I'm going to get all the presents. <laughs> oh, hey, dear. What's up? Where's your red nose? <laughs> oh, ho, ho. oh, you'll shoot your eye out, kid. Ho, oh, oh, ho. No, what do we got here? Santa. Santa. Oh, one of these special cases. I want all the toys. <coughs> oh, okay. But do you do all the good this year, little yeah, boy? Yeah, Christmas is great. Oh, perhaps a nice football for you. I want something that's unattainable. Something that you can't just give. Self-respect? Well, perhaps you would like a um, mineral rights in a Texas town so you can drill some oil or whatever. Well, close, but no cigar. It's equally as valuable, but not as quite the same. You're not the first person to ask for Disney stock. I just think that once the government destroys the Monopoly and breaks it up into many different studios, I'll make a mint, and with that mint, I'll be able to buy my own island, just like on that HD TV show. Ho oh, ho, okay, okay. <laughs> Thanks, Santa. Well, uh, here's a lollipop, and remember, as long as you're a good little boy yeah, or yeah, a good boy... Yeah, I know, boy, good boy, I'll get everything that I want, right? So right, so right. <laughs> I can't wait for this to happen. Disney's gonna get broken up by the government. Uh, let's see here. Uh, I don't know if this is right. Oh, man. My wife's going to kill me. i got to figure out what she wants for uh, jewelry. Uh, God, I just can't think. Excuse me, sir. Can you help me? Oh, God. What do you want now? I'm sick and tired of this. Ow, ow, ow. Well, perhaps that wasn't clear. Isn't the customer always right? Can't I get what I want? Can't you just show me more stuff? Sir, it's the Christmas rush. I can't just show you everything. You have to lower the supply to bring up the demand. That's how it works. There must be some sorts of... <laughs> I have four more hours to go in this, sir. Just 
just just take what you want and leave. <laughs> oh my god, are you okay? I lied to you. I was promoted to manager when the manager quit last week. Oh, I'm not ready for this kind of... He's just so hard to deal with. And now, I have to get going and... Well, does this make you manager now? By the rules of retail, yes. She'll be better. Crying now. Party later, dudes. Yeah, that almost reminds me. I have to wrap some presents as well. Ooh, all right, moving on to the next thing. And it's a little thing that's happening. Uh, it's the last city council of the year. There's a lot of last happening as well. I'm going to kick things off with uh, some of the city council where they're talking about, um, you know, Monday m was met with much discussion over the 4th Street project where the city will suspend the university overlay policy um, to create a high-density high condo complex with 75% buyers with 25% rent control. Other than that, stormwater fees are going up. Um, be aware that this it was a six-hour and 24-minute meeting overall. Of course, I'll gloss over many of the things that happened during this meeting, but uh, basically by the time they got into the 4th Street project and apartment um, deal, uh, it was probably about uh, 10, almost 11 p.m. when they actually started getting into this. So. Nick Kaufman with w WGM Group uh, is developing this four uh, uh, this four street project where they're going to be tearing down three uh, old historic brick buildings, and this is what he had to say in terms of the vision for the property. So the vision for the property is to provide housing downtown for a diverse population. Mm. <laughs> well, let him talk, please. All right. It's for people who want amenities of downtown without driving downtown. There's continuity between the residents in downtown. Walking access to neighborhoods because it's not just the university area neighborhood. It's the kind of focal point for three neighborhoods right here. Uh, to U of M trails in downtown. Up to 48 units are proposed, about 75% condominiums, and the rest would be apartments. We're including a parking garage, and we'd like to improve the neighborhood connectivity. Jeff? All right. So. The, one of the biggest things that the uh, city is uh, saying that the 4th Street, uh, while it is within the ward of the university district, they want to uh, suspend that idea because it is the basic corridor that opens up to the downtown Missoula area, and they wanted to build it on here. Of course, the laughter in the crowd from you here uh, when he talked about diversity. We'll get into that a little bit more with the public comment who are very concerned about what's going to happen in these areas where there's going to be uh, up to 48 units in this condo, but at the same time, they're afraid that there would be a potential Airbnbs. People would buy these condos, but then they do a month-to-month -month or, like, a, like they said, they're worried about Airbnbs and people second home rather than local owners who can't afford living in Missoula. Uh, Jeff Smith is also with the W. GM talks about tra traffic and congestion and a little bit more about connectivity. So this is what he had to say. Uh, think about the needs of downtown and the urban center and appropriate uses within this portion of the urban center. High density, high density residential uh, seems like a good fit. Generally, generally high density residential uh, generates less traffic than, than other similar downtown commercial uses. Also with the signalized access to, to Higgins Avenue, we've got good, good access to the rest of the transportation network. Also by placing res residential in this location near downtown and near the trail system, there's a good opportunity for mode shift. That's vehicle trips that would normally drive from outside into downtown, being shifted to bicycle and pedestrian trips. Okay, so that was, let me double check. That was Jeff Smith, who was with WGM. Our Missoula, a place called home, was a downtown master plan that was implemented. And, of course, it's not fully implemented. It's slowly being implemented. And this is a very interesting, uh, fluid time within the city of Missoula in terms of how they're working with the overlay that was put into place over a year ago with, from the university system to uh, keep the character of the neighborhood. WGM um, has been, um, they say that they've been working with uh, local areas and trying to figure out how they're going to match the aesthetic of this 
particular neighborhood. And also a little bit of more background of the brick buildings that are uh, could being considered being demolished. They haven't decided exactly if they're going to demolish any of those historic 100-year-plus buildings that are built in the Forest Street area. They, but they have different. They have many different options. Uh, one of the options is to move it. Another option is deconstruction, where they're going to salvage the bricks. And the other one is demolition. But from what the city of Missoula has been moving forward in terms of construction, is that they're looking for more deconstruction and rather than just um, uh, demolishing buildings. Okay. So Brian West, um, he's a he's during the public comment section. He kicks off the public input on the public hearing of all this. As we all just saw, a lot of people want to speak tonight, so there are some very basic facts that I want everybody to be aware of before we start. I'm positive that the council is aware of all of these because all this information came directly from the council. So we saw in that proposal that uh, in order to meet the council's goal for affordable housing, they propose four of their 36 or so units to be affordable housing units. However, the council's planning board in their research discovered that the existing buildings already provide seven units of affordable housing, which means that while the council's number one goal was to provide a whole affordable housing from this project, the net gain is negative three units of affordable housing. The, if that's the council's primary goal, how can they consider this public benefit? Secondly, the council's secondary goal was historic preservation. We just talked at some length about what's going to be done to preserve these historic buildings. The developer just said that he does not favor the third option, which was to reuse the buildings and incorporate the materials into their new construction. I saw no information in any of these presentations whatsoever about the feasibility of moving 100-year-old structures across town. And if anyone thinks that $12,500 is anything close to the cost of moving these structures, they have no idea what that kind of process is like. Those are the, it said directly in the presentation that those houses will be moved and $12,500 provided, provided that they're determined feasible for movement. And as, as we've all known, these are 100-year-old structures. Uh, the, the feasibility of that is ludicrous. It's All right, so uh, that was what um, um, Brian West had to say about that. Um, so far, the uh, current property has low rent because a lot of uh, um, issues with the building and what the owners of the building before they're selling it to the developers that are constructing this place, they kind of let it kind of go into um, what below living standards um, as a result, which resulted in the uh, low um the low rent as a result from just kind of like leaving it the way it is. And that's kind of what what has been done in the past is that dilapidated old buildings are low rent because they have to be because and then of course once they the concept is that if they build the new condos they're going to be more expensive than anyone can really handle and they're and the, one of the biggest concerns is that just because it's low rent now doesn't mean it's going to be uh, low rent months from now. So that's one of the things they're definitely concerned about because rent always changes and it's always a reflection of the property taxes within the area because honestly you have to have an even amount of money from the place going into it as um, going out from taxes and stuff like that. So here's Michael Albrighton and this is what he had to say um, about uh, this area as well in Fort Street. The growth policy is not simply a one-page map that says build this type of structure on this color, but rather a 343-page document with many goals and objectives that directs growth in our town. In the land use recommendations section of the growth policy, it says, I quote, decisions and implementation based on these designations should include consideration of the entire growth policy and site-specific conditions. If these five criteria are evaluated by considering the entire growth policy, it becomes clear the application to rezone the parcels to B13 and to remove the university district neighborhood character overlay does not meet criteria 1, 3, 4D, and 5. Indeed, the planning board during its discussion had a hard time with criteria 4D and 5. Planning Board Member Jason Rice stated that he struggled with number five and said that it would be a difficult one to prove. Planning Board Member Vince Caristo echoed that sentiment, sentiment and stated, I don't think the conclusions of law fully address the issue. Vin All right, so that's what um, 
Uh, Michael Albright inside the say university overlay was put in place to prevent many large structures from being built in the first place um, would cause blight and did not match the neighborhood char characteristics, which became a model for a place called home, the D Missoula downtown master plan. It was kind of like the soft master plan before they implemented the big master plan. From what I've noticed, from my opinion, um, here's Tim Lang. Um, this is what this is just another public comment about somebody. He he lives in this particular area, um, and he's and he he you know his lease is up back in February. But the the removal of the character overlay seems to really contradict the uh, kind of vague promises that have been made by the developer about respecting the character. If they were going to respect the character. They wouldn't need to remove the character overlay. As far as increased density. Uh, they did buy this property in order to make money. They're going to tear down these houses. I think that's going to happen. But they could build 18 units with the existing zoning, and that would increase the density. Um, obviously, I'd like to stay where I'm at, and I'd like things to stay where they are. They're not going to be that way. But All I right. So uh, that was many of the sentiment during the public hearing as well. But also, Tim Lang mentioned how he was misplaced before from rezoning in Missoula, which resulted in him commuting by bike in the winter from Elmar Estates to the downtown area. Um, regardless of what gets built, many folks think these will not be affordable housing because of how much it costs to build versus the tax associated, associated with the area that would be pretty steep. If you build anything that's close to downtown, it's going to be expensive. And they released a commercial residential uh, tax, um, and a lot of people were really surprised as how much, how expensive if it, how expensive it is just to live near downtown. Um, and you know, the, the closer you are to downtown, it, it is difficult for sure for a lot of people and a lot of taxes just in general. So anyways, this is Mr. Goldman. Um, I think it's his first name, but he's uh, pretty pro prolific in a lot of rezoning and policies and all stuff without, within the city and county of Missoula. And this is what he had to say. And a proposal to con construct affordable units of just 10% means that only 3.6 or 4 rounded up of the proposed 36 units for sale will be affordable. In no way is this a fair deal for the city, nor does it advance even the modest goals outlined in our recently adopted housing policy. Is downtown and the riverfront a place only for the wealthy to live? Or is there a place for everyone downtown? And are we as a community committed to even the modest strategies and approaches outlined in our own housing policy? I think these are the overarching questions that we're being asked tonight. I urge you to send this back to committee to, for further work to make sure the project adds to the community and doesn't detract from it. All right. So that was Mr. Goldman uh, talking a little bit about that. Um, and I think I'm going to um, move on to uh, some of the reactions to some of the city council. Um, they moved this back to committee. There's been a lot of people, the public comment during this section, and a lot of time, a lot of people stayed about four hours just to speak, and then the meeting went on for another uh, couple hours. Um, and there's a lot more to the public comments than I just showed you, but I just wanted to give you an, an overlay. I know, bad taste, right? Uh, just to uh, talk a little bit about what's happening within the city of Missoula. Here's Gwen Jones. Um, she's with the university, in the ward in the university, and she reflects on the high demand of housing in Missoula. Public comment is very important. We've had a lot of emails that have come in. I've read every single one, and I do my best to make sure they all get into the public record, and we've listened to comment. I think uh, these land use decisions are very emotional because we love Missoula. We care about this community. I don't think we're going to shrink. I think we're going to keep growing for numerous different reasons. So we're going to have to figure out not only this project, but I, the next four years I'm on council, I think we're going to be seeing a lot of these. So we're going to have to figure out how we're going to do it and how we're going to accept what's coming and make it work for us. Um, and our job is to listen to you and, and use the tools that we have to do the best we can. But All right, so that was Gwen Jones talking a little bit about that as well. The rezoning has been uh, sent back to committee and will be discussed January 8th, which is Wednesday. We'll, um, but of course, uh, you, you can check it, all this information out and more and being able to find your sources by going on to ci.missoula.mt.us. It is a wonderful resource for anything Missoula-centric, upcoming meetings, agenda items. Um, since this is a committee and it's going to be part of the land use and planning, it'll be on a Wednesday. So I believe the next uh, 
Wednesday meetings are January 8th, um, and it'll also have a new council. So we're going to have about uh, four, uh, three new members on the city council. Um, three and um you know and a couple of them um were voted in on that um on the 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 the, the ideology that tiffs are bad in the city of missoula and um you know just uh, kind of like an an end all kind of like end of the city council just kind of like a kind of like a, a fireside chat with me just to kind of see how things have developed over time a little bit of background a little bit about why they decided to go with tiffs um and a lot of times the city of missoula uh one of the, the biggest things that kind of happened uh, late, which kind of ended more special districts and urban development districts and stuff like that, is the implement, implementation of TIFs, um, SIDs. Think about it, special improvement districts. That was a big thing that was within the city of Missoula. They wanted to make sidewalks, improve infrastructure, but a lot of times the, one of the biggest issues that came into is that it would raise taxes in certain specific areas. I mean, a lot of times the city wanted to allocate some funds from one place and put it into another. But a lot of times, people in the in the count in the in the, all the city of Missoula was just like, I don't want to pay my taxes for this rundown neighborhood across town. And that's a lot of sentiment a lot of people have. I mean, there's a lot of like, um, there's a lot of people who don't want to pay for that kind of um, infrastructure improvements. So a lot of times what the city did later on was SID, special improvement districts, where the poor neighborhoods, as a result, was like, hey, you know, you, we're going to build you sidewalks, but you're going to pay for it for 20 years. It's, like, it's only going to be 25, uh, tw uh, like a dollar more a month. But it's going to be going on for uh, uh, for 20 years, and th that's kind of how SIDs became, in, you know, uh, available. But as more and more projects kind of stacked on each other, more taxes started to be coming into place, and so the city decided after the Hillview Way project happened, and with the league, uh, the issues that they had with a lot of the landowners with improving Hillview Way for that road that needed improvement as a reactionary thing, the next thing they wanted to do was TIFs, so tax increment financing, or as I like to call it, the future taxpayers' problems. And the people who develop on the land of that particular uh, area will uh, incur the cost of taxes. And of course, um, during the media assistant grants, there's the there was that uh, city uh, group and Alan Buchanan was in, in stating that uh, the tax base for a lot of uh, reconstructed and uh, TIF funding, that money that went into these properties, the taxable values of them shot up as a result uh, for development. Um, and that's just one of the things that the city has noticed is that by developing these new sites, offers in new uh, chances for a larger tax um, tax pool. So a lot of times the city of Missoula and the government can use this to make more money for more projects and more infrastructure improvements. So I can see on that regard of why it's such a huge uh, kind of um, push in that right direction. But I, at the same time, that one of the biggest things that are happening in terms of TIFs is that a lot of people are not happy that, uh, that we're basically uh, giving money and tax credits for uh, developers to build. It's like, when you build your construction area, we also want you to build a sidewalk and light light districts and you know street lights and stuff like that, um, and then we'll give you a tax break for that. And so uh, there was that kind of uh, um, concern from the community, and um, you've been seeing it the last couple of weeks, and I've been talking about it in my city council report that there's a lot of people who are not happy with the way TIFs are being used to uh, encourage development to be built here. But it's also a kind of a catch-22 in regards to the idea that the city of Missoula wants to improve the city of Missoula, and they want to use developers to uh, kind of kill two birds with one stone. And uh, a lot of times, uh, people are not happy the way things are growing, and affordable housing, because with affordable housing, they have to make it large enough so they can have that like with this four street project now that they're not now talking about is that they want to have be able to have affordable housing and rent and that kind of stuff with lower end affordable housing but like they said in a lot of the public comment that the net loss or the net the net gain is negative three with the loss of three houses with the uh a lot of these uh 
old buildings that have a lack of infrastructure, which is the reason why they're so low rent in the first place. All right, I'm rambling on, and I just wanted to uh, kind of just like kind of give you a little bit of background of kind of exactly how I see where the city is coming from when it comes to these policies and the way that they're using this as well. Um, and one other thing before I finish my rant um, is that if the city doesn't grow, people are not going to not want to move to Missoula. That's just never going to happen. People like Missoula. People are at the point where people want to come to Missoula and want to have a second home, build a monstrosity of a property, and Missoula is trying to react and try to uh, put regulations on being like, hey, we want you to match the stake of the town. All right, I'm still rambling. But the point is, is that with uh, less development, you have less supply. And with less supply, you have higher demand. With higher demand, you have higher prices in housing regardless. So you're not keeping up with the demand of housing. Therefore, the houses that already exist are going to be high up in price. And buying a new home becomes even more difficult than it is now. I mean, affordable housing is uh, a problem that's happened nationwide. But it's never going to not stop as long as people are going to want to move to the city of Missoula. And there's not many things from what I've noticed, and I've grew up in the city of Missoula, is that in terms of retention, you want a lot of people to uh, born in Missoula to stay in Missoula. But from what I've noticed, and from graduating high school here in the city of Missoula, is that many of my um, peers from high school left. They went to Bozeman, they went out of state, they went to many different universities, and most of them haven't really come back. So that's something that the city of Missoula should also look into. And rather than having uh, people coming in, maybe you should figure out a way for the city of Missoula to retain the people and have the kind of place here for a, a place called home for the city of Missoula. All right. Whew. There you go. There's, there's my end of the year uh, city council report uh, rant. Um, but I wanted to uh, talk to you about who some of your new constituents for wards 4, 5, and 6 are. Amber Sherrill. Uh, John P. Contos and Sandra Vasecki will be we're replacing uh, John Debari, Julie Armstrong, and Michelle Kares in that order. So those uh, folks, John Debari and Ward 4, will no longer be doing. He did not seek re-election. Julie Armstrong did not seek re-election. And Michelle Kares did not re seek re-election for city council. Uh, there was a bunch of committee meetings uh, as well with admin finance. I don't want to get into it, but uh, for the most part, the biggest thing that they talked about in admin and finance was talking about um, this, uh, the cities um, and the police. Uh, let me just double check my notes. It was the uh, every couple of years they work on a contract with the city uh, police department with money from pensions, investments towards longevity, um, and the city approved um, an update of it improving wages and raises for uh, the city police department as well. So that's kind of what happened with admin's finance. Um, that pretty much does it for your city council. I have some videos for you guys as well. Um, I'm running out of time, but I'm going to throw it over to some Dubbin stuff. Uh, uh, not Dubbin stuff. Jeez. Uh, it's Dude I Just Drew, another D uh, uh, show that I produce from MCAT. So here is Dude I Just Drew. It is from last Saturday's episode five of season two. Hey everybody, welcome back to another episode of Do They Just Drew with our very special guest, Eleanor. Um, as always, we have the rules that which these people have back here, our tech people here, three of them, have decided to make for us. Um, I already did it, but <laughs> I already messed up. But uh, yeah, let's draw, I don't know, coin toss. but they're fused into one instrument. <laughs> wow. <laughs> <laughs>
What would that look like? What do you, what do you think that yeah. would look like? Anyways? What do I think it would look like? Yeah. Um, well, if the people are fused, it'd be a lot easier. It'd just be a massive people. <laughs> <laughs> it's, a mass, it's a massive person. Yeah. With all the arms and all the instruments yeah. and stuff. Big buddy, okay. everybody's fine right now. Yeah. Some pretty good instruments. Thanks. I wish I could, I wish I could draw instruments like that, but... Seems a heart. A heart. Mm -hmm. and they still have, they, you know, strings. Like, would they be... Would Why they, are they looking so angry? Because they, they're fighting over who gets to play. Hey. Whoa! <laughs> For some reason, it just went out of focus as soon as you finished. Hey, yeah, awesome. Let me put there my hand go. there. We have, like, probably... Oh, we had, like, three seconds of uh, image, and... Done. Done. All right. Nice. Awesome. Nice. There we go. All right. All right. I get to pick the next thing. Mm -hmm. uh, the next one is the White House. Okay. <laughs> the White. The, the current the state. House? The current state. State of the White House, or just the White House. I don't like. I don't like the look of the White House because the White House is just like this little square, and then it's just like check it out, guys. There's some pillars over here. Some bushes. So we got orange as president. That was the first. That was the first very interesting thing. But I don't know. I don't know if a lot of people. They have like a, like a basket of oranges. President. Yes. Well, is that getting clipped? I mean, I'm not. I'm not saying that it's anybody specific. <laughs> <laughs> a White House and a White Capitol building. <laughs> no, yeah. And a this. Everything else that's going on, I don't know. <laughs> What's your favorite thing about the White House? Album? I like it when they have pets. I think it's the duty of every president to have multiple pets. It is. The I'm. Bread. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> is that the Christmas turkeys? <laughs> the Thanksgiving turkeys. <laughs> ah, the, the, the pardon ones? Yeah. The spooky Q. Oh, oh, oh. Spooky Q. <laughs> yeah. Spooky Q. Wait, what's this? No, that was an intimidating. That was an intimidating cube, wasn't it? Oh yeah, that's right. Yeah, I'm continuing okay. with my cube series. Of eight equals MC cube instead of square. Uh, welcome to well, physics two. So, <laughs> do you want to know? <laughs> so E equals MC squared. That's saying that mass is basically equivalent to energy. That C squared is just a conversion factor. Um, if you look at relativity. Um, you're looking at, um, it's just going from relativistic units. So in relativity, you measure distances in seconds instead of meters. So you just, so say you have like one meter, you divide it by one meters per second to get it into, no, you divide it three times times the eighth meters per second. Is that a real type of cat munchkin cat? Yeah. Really? Yeah, they have short legs. I did not know they were called munchkin. The Whoa. Cut the electricity bill. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we're doing this. It's the spookiness. <laughs> it's the spookiness. <laughs> 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 oh! <laughs> the MCAT cat's kind of spooky. I guess it kind of is. It's always like, oh, shoot, yeah, the, that it's one. It's always there. <laughs> and now that there's like, the other one isn't as bad because it's like, it's just like a silhouette of the cat on its side. Mm. On the side, so it's just walking on its side. This one, I, I forgot, I had glowing white eyes. Yeah. <laughs> Rock climbing, wall climbing, an object. Why did you put a comma? Why did you put a comma? That's just bad grammar. And your name's Graham. Grammar. <laughs> Graham, get better grammar. <laughs> I'm drawing the picture of the wall from the Pink Floyd's The Wall. Oh, I see. I don't know. Is that a face? Is that a little face? No, it's not. <laughs> it could be. <laughs> I had to see. I couldn't see. Your hands in the way. Nice. <laughs> the little guy on the, the, on the left is like, what is he saying? His name's Alex Honnold. And then the wall. The, the is someone you went to school with? No, he's, a, he's the guy from Free Solo who climbed El Capitan Town without ropes. Whoa. Yeah. Whoa. Fuji, Japan. <laughs> yeah. Why won't you an elf practice? Do you want to draw? Should we draw another mountain thing or? That's the one that says. Mount Fuji, Japan. That's your brother. <laughs> yeah, because <laughs> he went to Japan this summer. Nice. What's your brother's name? Owen. Hi, Owen. Hello, Owen. Are they both? It's perspective. Are they, are they both? <laughs> <laughs> Are they both? Did they both go to the same side? <laughs> so we're gonna draw this little. I don't remember seeing this little tree branch. I don't know why it's there. And then there's this little kid. 
that I always remember seeing like an image of. Um, hey guys, another great episode, a chill episode. As always, you can find us at uh, our website, on Dude I Just Drew. Um, Spreadshirt. My social media is nowhere.arts. My Twitter is uh, nowhere exclamation mark. <laughs> Five after after a month. Um, yeah. All right. Uh, see you guys later. Bye. <laughs> hey guys, welcome back. I only have a couple more minutes left in the show, so I'm going to talk a little bit about some breaking news about the Higgins Bridge. So Higgins Bridge is now on hold. Um, according to KPAX, uh, they released a story just uh, not more than 19 minutes ago, is that they decided that MDT uh, decided not to award a bid of $32 million that was asked by the city of Missoula. Uh, the original uh, thought that um, MDT thought they were going to be bidding a project that was $16 million, but the uh, request was $32 million. So, so far, it's on hold. And what originally was going to be slated for January of 2020 for the restoration of the Higgins Bridge project has been uh, put on hold. And look for more information by uh, subscribing to KPAX uh, for, uh, for more about this story that is uh, evolving. Um, but of course, as we are transitioning into the holiday season, most uh, government or any kind of deals are kind of be not doing much this uh, winter time as well. But I wanted to kind of say, I hope you guys have a wonderful holiday season as well. There's a lot going on this weekend as well. It is the 20th, only five days away from Christmas. Yeah, I'm date. I'm um, basically time stamping myself as well. Um, as a public library, I just wanted to say that they're going to be doing a special thing today as well. Uh, they're going to have a special visitor during during story time. Um, they have a bunch of other stuff as well. They have some caroling at the library. Just a lot of stuff happening at the Visual Public Library. I just wanted to make sure that you guys go check it out as well um, with Holly Cookie decorating. And then uh, Glacier Ice Rink is doing a lot of holiday skating with a special gift as well. They're all Santa. Okay, they're Santa. But also, I want to give a shout out to uh, Asaf Adonai. Um, he originally was planned to end his uh, tenure at the Southgate Mall uh, for holiday playing music, but they have him on until Christmas Eve. So if you get a chance to see him at the Southgate Mall, he'll be playing well until uh, Christmas Eve on the 24th next Tuesday. So you can say hi to him for us here at MCAT. We miss him. He does shows here on MCAT, but he hasn't uh, been here as much the last month. So if you guys get a chance to say, hi, Saf, we miss you. All right, so without further ado, I hope you guys have a great uh, Christmas, New Year's, and all that stuff. I will be back in the new year starting January 3rd. Um, I don't know if there's going to be any kind of changes to the show format or anything like that, or just keep it the same. Most likely, I'll keep it the same. Maybe I'll have some fun, video, fun videos for you guys this uh, holiday season as well as we go into the season. But that's all I have to say about that. And for Wake Up Missoula, I'm Scott Ramph. Take care and have a wonderful, wonderful weekend and holiday break.